So, Stuart, whenever you want, the floor is all yours. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, this is a real pleasure to be here and see uh, Inigo and Technique, Technica and encouragement from my um, friend Jose uh, Luis Fernandez and trying to rebuild and reconfigure the TA3, but in different ways. It's obvious from what I saw earlier that the times have changed when I saw what you showed at the uh, your current site there. I'm going to I have to address very different issues and needs. What I want to do is explain why and how we started the Alliance and see if any of it can be useful in the current economic environment and for reconfiguring. Okay. It began in uh, 1987. It's no doubt before some of you were born as a regional project in the US of an alliance of governors of the 13 Southern states. The business friendly Southern US, because of its low costs and lower, no taxes, was still losing out to the higher levels of technologies and skills used across <coughs> Europe and Japan. And the US at that time had almost no government assistance for manufacturers. Uh, but my background and what I'd done recently with vocational technical colleges and vocational education, I realized there were community colleges and technical colleges that were stepping up to help businesses learn about and adopt these new technologies to be more competitive. And I was able to convince the uh, 13 Southern governors of the organization I was working with that these community colleges were underappreciated and could do a lot to help the South's manufacturing base. I was able to raise, raise more than a half a million dollars from two federal agencies uh, and ask each state governor to choose one school, one college to be in this, what we call the Startup Alliance, the CMC, the Consortium for Manufacturing Competitiveness. Now, the governor who chaired this alliance uh, and led the support for the CMC was Bill Clinton of Arkansas, who, of course, five years later went on to become president. But it happened at the same time that Americans, um, uh, uh, policymakers and educators were looking to the Europe for their future. So inspired by this, what we were learning from successes in, use, successes in Western Europe, Hannah Shapiro at the Danish Technological Institute and I were able to get financial support from the German Marshall Fund in the US and the European Union to organize a conference in Washington, DC in May of 1984. And we developed a plan to expand this consortium to include schools from other parts of the US and from Europe. We want to grow nationally and internationally. And this is the map of the original membership. We relied on suggestions from our, our new secretariat, Nigel Payne in uh, Scotland and colleagues in the OECD and the EU and people that Hannah and I knew in Europe and the US to find other members. And just so happens that Jeff Raffin, the president of the college at Amy Cox at in Green Bay, was then the chancellor of the New Hampshire Community College System. And he became our first member from outside uh, the South. It's a small Northern state that looks like an island on that map, but it's not an island. And EUC Sud became a charter member, then represented by its uh, president, Sven Olson, and of course now by Hans Lehmann. Our goal was never to become another association that just held a meeting and generated revenue from membership dues. We wanted to be small. We wanted to uh, build personal relationships and trust and promote innovation and learning. In Europe, for example, uh, they wanted to learn more about how we dealt with entrepreneurial training, uh, technology centers, business incubators, and Americans wanted to learn more about European apprenticeships, about how they develop skill standards and the, the governing through social partnerships. We sought members who wanted to connect research to practice and ultimately to policy. For this, we needed an international advisory board to give us legitimacy. So we created this board, and this is one example of the board. Uh, what it looked at one point in time, the members stayed on for usually three to five years. Um, and this is an example of who served representatives of government, industry, research, education from across 
Europe and the U.S. And the, the board never met in person, but members frequently attended our conferences and spoke at our conferences, participated in projects, and and basically lent support and gave us ad hoc, ad hoc advice as needed. And then, of course, we needed co-secretariats, one in Europe and one in the U.S., uh, to provide leadership from both sides of the Atlantic. And Nigel Payne from Scotland and Cynthia Liston in the U.S. and Lars Müller Benson in, in Denmark all served at various times as secretariats. And the secretariats were there to make sure that the accomplishments of the TA3 were shared with other schools and organizations, and they reached people in places that could influence public policy and generate and find resources and support. Um, the TA3 has been very project-oriented, and the Secretariat often identified opportunities, wrote grant proposals, coordinated work, and also informally facilitated exchanges among students and faculty. Our most effective way to reach people was through our regular conferences, which at the time we held about eight, every eight or nine months on cutting edge topics. And they might be the next wave of educational reforms or technological and social trends or the changing nature of the workplace. And we planned these always in cooperation with a host college and alternated between the US and Europe. And we sought large and influential audiences so we could share our, idea, our ideas. And each meeting was a one to one and a half day symposium that was open to the public and widely promoted, a members only business meeting, a tour of the host college and social events to build relationships. We had to raise money for most of these, of course. And I remember one meeting in Western North Carolina, we had grants from nine different organizations ranging from a large US government agency to this Cherokee Indian Preservation Fund. And these are just some examples of themes that we held for meetings. You can see, I'm not gonna go through these, but it just gives you an idea of the topics we've addressed over time. And most of these were relatively new at the time and, and introduced colleges to new topics they hadn't been spending a lot of time on. And none of, most of them led to publications and some of these to projects and even additional alliances. The meetings were never all work, of course. Socialization was one of the most important parts of the, what we did. And these are just some pictures from our meetings. You can see a boat trip along uh, Copenhagen's Canal on the, on the upper left, uh, the, the tour of a program at uh, the college in Green Bay, the Jose Luis introducing my wife to your apple cider. Um, I guess you can, you know where that is happening. It's not far from you. A fish dinner at a camp outside of Tampa, Finland. Uh, the Secretariat, uh, Lars Miller Benson and Cynthia Liston taking a beer break in Galway, Ireland. And our traditional dance and beer in, in Berlin. And beer, of course, has always been an important part of TA3 programs. Although I have to say that hard cider in San Sebastian was a nice change and a nice alternative. Here's an example of the publications that have been in bus because they, they enhance the TA's three rep reputation and share what members have developed and improved or discovered. And some of these were written for organizations such as the OECD, the EU, uh, US government agencies, foundations, some were for journals and magazines, and some were internal, designed mainly for members. We always wanted to share what we learned as far as much as we could because it helped uh, would help the other schools in our region and help our governments too. We produced a regular newsletter, an eight to 10 page quarterly newsletter that described the Alliance activities, news for member colleges, events, ideas of potential interest. We profiled one member in each issue. The newsletter was disseminated to you know, brag about what we've done, about the, what the schools have done, the activities of members, and promote their accomplishments individually and collectively. And our distribution list was very large, which included hundreds of other colleges, associations, government, uh, government agencies, researchers, businesses around the globe. 
Here's an example of just a couple of the programs that we had funded. Uh, the one LSICE is Learning Through Simulated Information Technology Enterprises was a way to incorporate business and entrepreneurial skills into IT programs by simulating the business. And then they'd be run by teams of students uh, who were re role playing different parts, different roles in the organization. And teams of TA3 members designed the curriculum uh, for these two different types of businesses. Then we ran workshops around the US for non member schools that want to learn about how to adopt these curricula. And these schools, of course, were funded to come to the US and, uh, and for their work. We had a fairly large grant from the National Science Foundation in the US. The other earlier project developed and tested multi-institutional uh, online learning. And this was very early in the development of web-based learning uh, before, before Zoom or FaceTime or anything else. It was at the time really groundbreaking. Students talking to each other around the globe uh, on the internet over, over the uh, computers. And the project even led to an invitation to testify before a subcommittee of the US Congress to describe what the TA3 had developed and its potential. In areas that were new to technical colleges, we tried to develop uh, once in a while some learning and innovation networks. And these were alliances that were for TA3 members, but we also invited other colleges to join us that had similar interests and specialized expertise. And, and some of these uh, took on joint projects and operated almost in parallel with the TA3 for many years. Craftnet, for example, targeted college programs for creative occupations and businesses, areas that were generally misunderstood and underdeveloped by community colleges. And this continued for about 10 years. The Alliance for Sustainability, uh, which was funded by the Ford Foundation, uh, focused on environmental programs and sustainable agriculture, again, both of which were not strongly represented in uh, two-year colleges, at least that we found. The Medical Device Industry Consortium met and organized a conference in Galway. It worked with medical device cluster associations to develop new curricula. And just a few examples. Uh, on the upper left, the Alliance for Sustainability, or in the lower left, uh, with help from Hans Lehmann, organized a tour of Denmark's sustainable building programs. I think Amy Cox went on that tour. Uh, we assembled a website of all the sustainable agriculture uh, education programs we could find across the U.S. with links to them. Uh, and CraftNet had a regular conferences and it, its own website and quarterly newsletters. Finally, we also developed, uh, expanded the student and faculty exchanges. And this took us a while to get to. It's really only been the last five years that these exchanges began to happen. Uh, something that the Europeans wanted and the EU supported, but we had trouble getting support from that in the US and it was hard to get support from the US colleges. What they didn't really recognize yet the value of going overseas. They thought of it as a boondoggle and not something that would really help what they did or, or support their programs. And it took a while to get to that point, but they finally have gotten there. There is now federal and national support and they've, they've come to realize we've, we're not quite as provincial as we used to be. And there's a desire now to learn more about what's happening abroad. Finally, I want to just close with the challenges that we've faced. Uh, one of them, maybe the biggest one, is changes in institutional leadership. If, a, if the change, if the chancellor or president of a college was replaced or there was a uh, reorganization of a system, often they didn't recognize the value of the TA3 and they didn't want to invest the money or the time into it. And that happened in some US schools. It happened in Wales and Scotland uh, when schools reorganized and merged. And you have to sort of go back and explain all over again and convince people of the value of it. Uh, the second, of course, is language barriers. And it's, much, it's an issue really for the US because we've had to have our meetings in English. And it really is the reason we've had members from Southern Europe with the language that prevented us from getting more uh, members from Southern Italy or for 
or from Greece or some of the or Portugal. And even though that's changing now, I don't think it's a problem anymore, of course, because first of all, uh, there's, because of the internet and because of streaming, and English has become much more of a common language. I don't think we've gotten very much farther in the US of learning second languages though. Uh, and the third is finding the resources to support our activities, which takes time. You have to have the connections, you have to know where to go and you have to be lucky. And finally is finding the right issues to address in sc carefully scanning the research, uh, talking to people, it's partly luck. It's, uh, but some of these uh, work and some hit the bullseye and develop a following and actually affect policy. And some have gone on for a while and they just fall by the wayside. But I think we've had more successes than failures, fortunately. So this is really all about the past. It's now up to you to figure out what you want to do with the rest of the, with the future of the TA3 and what's important. I mean, obviously the economy has changed. Uh, issues have changed. COVID is changing everything, the way we learn, the way we interact, the way we communicate. So I think there's some real opportunities to be on the cutting edge once again. Thank you.